Hello and thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 421. Today's episode is titled Martial Arts, Superheroes, and Neuroscience. Kind of a strange title, but honestly, it was hard to put today's conversation into a short title. But I am joined by my guest, Sensei Paul Zare. And as you listen, that title will make a lot more sense. Now, don't forget, we do this show twice a week, and you can find out everything about the show and the episodes and the guests at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. You can sign up for the newsletter where we give you discounts. We tell you about new products. We do a lot. And we only send that out a couple times a month. If you want to know more, the best place to go is WhistleKick.com. We've got everything that we've got going on over there, links to the various projects and websites that we do. And we've got a store. That store has protective equipment, uniforms, training aids, apparel, a ton of stuff. And you can find that of course, at whistlekick.com. And if you use the code podcast15, you get to save 15% on the whole shebang. This is the point in the show where I give you an intro, where I set the tone for what you're going to hear, or why we reached out to a certain guest, or maybe talk about what it was in our initial conversations with a guest that help you understand why we brought them on the show. I can't do that. (laughs) I can't do that with today's episode. Because we talked about some really interesting, really different stuff. And to try and boil that off into two or three sentences just doesn't work. So I'm going to ask that you trust me. If you've listened this far, I'm sure you're going to. But just go ahead, listen to this episode. And I found it to be fascinating because of the ways that Sensei Zare connects what seem to be very different things. But of course, the way he looks at them, the way he presents them, And the way I heard them, it makes complete sense. So I hope you enjoy today's slightly different, but nonetheless entertaining and informative episode. Sensei Zare, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thanks for having me on. It is an honor to have you on. And listeners, you know, we're, we've started doing this a little bit more where we'll reach out to someone who hasn't been on the show before, who hasn't told their personal story, but they have something to say, something that, that, maybe they can flesh out for us. And today we've reached out to Sensei Zare to talk about the what I'm going to call a connection between martial arts and the brain. So we did a little bit of research and your name kept coming up and we reached out and fortunately you were kind enough to say, yeah, I'll come on the show. So even though we're going to talk about that stuff, you and I, we, we batted around, well, r- really, you proposed a little bit of a co- flow to the conversation, and it kind of started with how you started with martial arts. So I, I'd, I'd love for you to kind of take that as you had suggested and, and give us that, that lead point, and that'll, you know, we can, we can roll forward. Yeah, well, I'm pleased to talk about that, especially because I think a lot of the ways we think about neuroscience, which is my specialty for research now, really relates to a lot of the things we, we do in martial arts. But in, in my particular case, it, it all started with my mom, um, who uh, got me interested in comic books and superheroes when I was a kid, uh, because she grew up, you know, back in the golden age of comics, you know, when, when Superman and Batman and Captain America and these folks were, were literally first hitting the pages of the, of the pulp comics. And she adored comic books when she was a kid and, and got me into to reading them as well as a kind of a gateway drug to all kinds of other reading and um the the thinking i did when i was just thinking of the fantastical things i saw comic book characters do characters like batman like shang chi like iron fist these martial arts guys um really got me interested or helped feed an interest in martial arts and um from that you know once i started doing martial arts as an early teenager i just got fascinated with you know, once you get past the realization that you're not going to be Iron Fist in a couple of weeks, um, <laughs> I, um, I I got interested in the science of human performance, and 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 you know what really it just fascinated me. Like, what the heck is going on? You know, I'd I'd gain some skill, of course, from training as as you do, um, but I'd see you know teachers and and very high ranking and extremely skilled martial artists who'd come from uh japan or wherever they were from and they would be demonstrating things or doing things with me and i'd be like it is like a superhero what i'm seeing that kind of skills like how did that person do that and and that really got me fascinated on trying to understand the science of that 
which took me to university where I did an undergraduate and master's degree in kinesiology related themes and, and, and did, you know, actual research studies on some aspects of the physiology of martial arts at that time, you know, cardiovascular and neuromuscular stuff. Um, but then shortly after that, and, and this sort of planted a theme that I didn't recognize till later, um, uh, instead of just dealing with highly trained folks and what they were able to do, I, I really got interested in what the nervous system was doing, you know, controlling those movements, which at first were studies of martial arts, but which became trying to understand the rehabilitation of walking after, you know, stroke and spinal cord injury. And, and that spent, you know, I spent a lot of my career doing studies that um, were about trying to understand the continuum of human performance, you know, that we've got um, highly trained folks who can be trained to be almost superhuman. Uh, and we got other folks who are on the same continuum, but at a lower level of performance who've, you know, had some kind of injury or damage to the brain or spinal cord that has, has pushed them to a lower level of performance. And they can benefit from the same uh, ideas and training principles and physiology and neurobiology to improve their abilities. Um, and I wanted to share that with, with people uh, through teaching and training and, and doing research and talking about it, which um, got me into science communication because I wanted to communicate, you know, the wonders of, of different things that go on in the body that, you know, that kind of captivated me, you know, back as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And when I did my science communication stuff, I wanted to do it in a way that folks would find accessible and interesting to learn about. So I, I chose superhero comic characters like Batman, Captain America, Iron Man, Batgirl. Um, and I slip in there all kinds of things around human performance and neurobiology and neuroplasticity of training, how the brain and spinal cord adapt to things. And in many cases, particularly for Batman, a big example I used throughout my Becoming Batman book was all about Batman as a martial artist and what's going on in his brain and spinal cord and what's happening with his muscles and how would that be the same if, if it were Batwoman or Batgirl and how we're all very similar and even trying to talk about you know, all my books actually bring up martial arts. I, I talked about how in my Iron Man, Inventing Iron Man book, I mentioned that, you know, Tony Stark's got this fantastic suit of armor, but it doesn't always work right. So he actually has to train in martial arts too and give examples of that. Same for Captain America, same for Batgirl. All these characters that I've used in my different books are all about trying to explore the positive potential of, of martial arts training in, in doing different things, whether it's, you know, just getting stronger yourself or, uh, having a feeling of self-confidence and achievement, or, you know, in the case of those superheroes, uh, sort of being part of the backstory um, of them. And during that process, it's kind of interesting sometimes if you reflect on what you're doing and why, I, I started to realize a lot of the things I was doing was connected, and it all kind of came back to that start in martial arts, that um, teaching martial arts or training in martial arts is about empowering other folks, you know, literally providing physical prowess for, you know, self-defense skills, but empowerment through knowledge and ability and skills, which was basically what I realized at that point some years ago is essentially the core of everything that I do as a person in the world, whether it's a, as a scientist, as an author, or as a martial artist, and sort of brought all these things together to think about um, how I can continue to work to help empower folks um, after injury or in uh, you know just states like uh, aging and so on which kind of circled me back to to where i started and and uh someone listening in could sort of imagine a, a big sort of uh calligraphy diagram of the the void that you often see uh, you know the big circle uh you know starting as i did back in my teenage years uh with martial arts and then eventually in the science of martial arts i've kind of circled back and trying to complete that that uh, calligraphy um, with some recent work that we've been doing where um, a lot of my studies prior to the most recent projects had been looking at ways we can help somebody who's had a stroke, for example, who doesn't walk very well because of their injury. How can we help retrain them to improve their walking ability, improve their strength and balance and these kinds of things. And we'd use, you know, interventions like different things in studies like arm cycling training, arm and leg cycling, strength training, like machine-based stuff that you'd find in a lab or a rec center. I, all my research interventions tend to be, I want them to, if we're going to test something and find out if it works, I want to make sure folks can use it right away. So I don't want fancy machines and uh, devices that you can only find in my lab. I want them to be accessible. 
And with those ideas in mind, uh, we recently have started to address the idea of using uh, martial arts training uh, in older adults and in folks with stroke, Parkinson's disease, and other sort of aging, typically aging associated uh, pathologies as a way to um, help them be empowered and address some of the deficits they're finding in a way that we hope will will help improve their function. Um, uh, we actually, because you got to have a little uh, acronym, so we call it the KIC, which is the Karate Intervention for Chronic Conditions. And um, it's been really neat to actually apply all those things that I've sort of spent the last, you know, 36 or 37 years in martial arts and, you know, about 30 years in science. Um, putting them all together uh, as a way to help people. And, and you know, when I, when I reflect on that, which I have tended to do as I've gotten older and think about, you know, how I got to where I am and where I'm trying to go, it, it sort of brings me back to um, how all that stuff started, that uh, a mom who just tried to share her interests in, in comic books and, and human performance uh, seed was planted in me and, and took me on this, this journey that I continue on that, is really quite fulfilling. Hmm. Those, that instruction, um, those classes, whether it's class or or one on one, this kick program that you just mentioned, would those of us watching know that you were teaching these people towards a certain goal, or does it look like a normal martial arts class? It, it looks like a generally a normal martial arts class. Uh, with the exception that um, what I've sort of done is modified some of the material so that it, it's not as challenging in certain contexts at the beginning. So for example, um, we, for, for the purposes of the, of the intervention we did, we, we took out things like any sort of, you know, uh, wrist locking things and, you know, break falling and, and anything. Um, and we also removed kicking uh, from any of the techniques we were teaching in the initial portion. Um, so that the balance challenges that folks would be experiencing are more about shifting their weight while they step, if they're punching and blocking or turning in a certain stance, uh, rather than having them, you know, teetering on one leg, doing a, doing a kick, which, which is ironic given the name of the intervention, right. I'll admit. Um, <laughs> but punch didn't work right as a thing. So, um, so we, the idea would be if we're going to continue with some of this stuff would be, of course, to slowly start introducing more of that. But what we essentially did was what I would call more of a graduated entry um, to a lot of the technical content that you'd find in a, in a typical uh, martial arts training session, probably anywhere or certainly when, when I'm teaching. Um, uh, but it would look very similar. I mean, we made sure, um, one of the, the reasons why I like the idea of, of piloting uh, an intervention uh, using martial arts is that, um, you know, given my background, it's probably not surprising that I'm a big advocate for people to be physically active and to do do things in the world. Um, but but I think uh, activities need to be meaningful. And, and what I mean by that is, um, and I don't want to put this kind of activity down, and I do it myself, you know, riding a stationary bike or running on a treadmill or, or whatever it is. But those activities are, are really just for physiological training. You know, you're trying to work on your cardiovascular fitness because you, you don't have an opportunity to do that in other parts of your life necessarily or fitting in your exercise bout or what have you. Learning martial arts, though, you know, is more about empowering you and, and feeling about some functional ability that goes with um, the things you're doing. And in fact, in my opinion and the way I tend to approach things, it's more that you kind of have a fitness benefit just in passing, but that's not the major focus, but it, you should have that, but, but it's going to occur um, as a result of the meaningful activity you're doing. And you're going to be feeling that the activity you've learned and the skills, the physical skill gives you a feeling of empowerment. And, and I bring that up because one of the things that we definitely did maintain, uh, even in this group of older adults, and I, I, I just as an aside, what an amazing experience it was to actually teach a 90 year old martial arts for the very first time in their life. Wow. Um, you know, we had a few folks who were, who were fairly old, um, who were out there trying to do these things and were interested, you know, they get recruited into the study because they wanted to try martial arts. And it was just amazing to actually see them, um, gaining some of the abilities, learning some of the patterning we were doing. And also coming back to what I was saying about the meaningful aspect, 
uh, we made sure that we taught it the martial arts intervention in a way that was the way we would normally do in, in a dojo or, or a training session normally, which was to explain these movements, we're doing them a little slower, we're doing this, we're doing that, but here's the meaning of the movements. This is meant to be a defense against a kick, and this means to grab the leg, and this is a punch here, and this is this. And then making sure that even though they did them slower, we also worked through um, some of the applications. So they could they, they got the full flavor of everything. This this movement you're doing is, is dodging out of the way, it, it's deflecting an attack, then you grab the arm, and then you would punch, or whatever the example would be. But making sure they actually you know, got exposed to that because for them, that was providing more meaning and context. And, and, and for me as a, a martial artist, of course, that's so I could be authentic and have integrity about what I was trying to share and what some of my trainees who were, who were uh, involved in the training as well uh, were doing. Um, but that it also um, allowed for a situation where um, as a a scientist, I could imagine that they're getting more buy-in to some of the things that they're doing and that um, the way they're going to feel about themselves after learning martial arts for a five-week intervention, which is what we typically have used for these sort of uh, brief intervention test studies, they're going to feel a bit different and probably more positively about what they did than if they had done arm cycling in the lab, you know, for the same kind of sessions and dose of activity. Um, even though it might have been very similar time commitment that, you know, you don't, folks didn't tend to leave the lab after doing our arm cycling training, which was quite powerful and a really useful thing to have done and has a really important application in rehabilitation. But you don't tend to feel, I don't think, the same way about yourself and your capacity that I got really good at arm cycling as compared to, you know, I learned how to defend myself a little bit, even if it's slower. Um, and, and I think that's really critical to getting folks engaged in um, trying to improve themselves and their abilities. And sure. Now, I would imagine that if this is happening as part of scientific research, that there's some data you're collecting before, maybe even during, and, and certainly after these five-week interventions. You know, what, what does that data collection look like? Yeah, I mean, what we tried to do, and I'm, I'm very systematic about how I've approached, you know, various aspects of my career, but especially uh, from the science end of things. So we had already developed kind of a template for how we would do these interventions and the kinds of measures that we would make. So we knew, uh, or we, we, we had a good idea about what sort of measures might be the most sensitive, what reflects a functional gain, all these things because of all the other intervention studies we'd, we'd done in the past using things, as I mentioned, like strength training or, or armor like cycling training or, or various other modalities. So the basic idea, um, that we do in, in my research program for these, these interventions is we we have a bunch of pretests and one of the things that um, I've been pushing very hard for in um, my application studies these interventions is we don't typically use a control group like a complete control untrained group to compare people to um, you know the whole idea of control groups designs like that is you need to do that if you're doing a drug study but if you're doing a physical activity intervention you, you're getting too much variability from people so what we do is it takes a lot more time what, what we do, but I think it's much better. We get folks to come into the lab and they have to do the pretest, all the measures we're gonna do three times on three different days. And we use that to develop. So if you came into the lab, let's say, and you were gonna do one of our interventions, you'd have to come in and do the same pretest measures of strength, of balance control, of um, spinal cord excitability, of muscle activation, uh, the psychological questionnaires that we administer as well, you, you do them multiple times so we can kind of create some variability for you. Like how much do you change from day to day so that we can know at the end of the intervention um, and we do the post-test assessment, does this um, data that we get at the end of the intervention actually represent a meaningful change from what your baseline is? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it takes a long time and participants have to be okay with the idea of doing all the kind of boring stuff at the beginning when really they, in this case, were quite keen to do some martial arts training. Um, but we do all the measures uh, before three, three different sessions. Then we have the five weeks of training and then we uh, get the folks back into the lab within a week of the last session to do their post-test assessment. Um, so it's actually a pretty big time commitment for people, um, both the, the folks involved in, in uh, you know, as the participants in our study, which uh, are obviously the only way we can do these studies, but also for 
um, like graduate trainees, you know, the masters and doctoral students that are, are training with me who were involved in these projects, including uh, one of my trainees who led the bulk of all the training uh, for folks. Um, uh, I tended to come on Fridays, uh, but they were training Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, because of my own schedule. Um, but one of my uh, doctoral trainees who will be finishing her PhD this fall um, and who just recently achieved her black belt with me becoming the first and probably only trainee I'll ever have that will actually uh, get a PhD and, and a black belt under my supervision, um, <laughs> cool. which it, it is cool. Actually, I, I bring it up because it, for me, it's really just a neat thing. Like uh, I, to think about all the stuff we've been talking about here about how martial arts can empower and all these things. And then to have um, someone who uh, was especially keen when she was interested in coming to work with me for, for her neuroscience training, um, but really had done martial arts elsewhere. I was really keen on, on training with me in martial arts as well. Um, but a lot of time for, for, uh, for Yao, that's the student, for her to do all the work she did uh, in the intervention itself. So a lot of time and effort goes into these things. Um, but of course, that should be no surprise uh, to anybody who's interested in martial arts, right? It, it takes time and effort and perseverance and repetition. So there's some themes here that definitely overlap. Can you give us an example of one of those data points that you're collecting before and after and, and what a, I don't know if you've done enough of this that you can say what a typical or average median change is? Yeah, we can't say quite yet. Um, this is sort of hot off the presses, so to speak. We've just completed the intervention and all the data analysis is still ongoing because okay. it takes quite a while to do. But what I can tell you um, uh, is that I can give you an example of the kinds of things that, that we tend to see. Yeah, please. One of the, one of the um, ideas that's really important as kind of a science question and a social question around uh, helping folks get, you know, better ability if they've got Parkinson's or, you know, a, a neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's where you're trying to affect the disease trajectory. That is, you, you know, you, doing martial arts is not going to cure Parkinson's, um, but it can change the slope of the decline. So if it's really steep, it might be a little, a little bit less steep. Uh, we know that um, other activities can do that. Or if you've had a stroke um, and you've got some balance issues, which are very typically arising after a you know, lesion in the brain that occurs as a result of the, the stroke event. Um, you know, the idea of training to improve balance and or just older adults, we know that folks tend to have um, decreased balance control as they get older. And a result of all these things is that uh, people are more vulnerable to falling down. And, um, you know, when we're younger or when we're doing martial arts and maybe we're doing martial arts, which involve a lot of falling down, learning how to do it, we don't think about you know, the potential catastrophic event that can occur if if somebody who's uh, a frail older, older adult at, say, 80 years of age falls down and, and breaks their hip, uh, what that actually does to the cardiovascular system and how often that often results in a massive uh, cardiac event, you know, with a, uh, and, and big potentially life-threatening outcomes. It's a serious issue. So um, one of the things that we tried to build into this was the idea of a balance you know, the idea being that really what we're doing with martial arts training generally is, is training our balance and our posture. And so that's embedded in the training. And then the way we measure that, um, we developed from some other studies um, a way to give a postural perturbation, meaning a, a, a something that affects your balance control. Um, some labs, what that would mean would be like a really fancy device you'd stand on and it would tip and change, you know, kind of like you're on a moving boat or a, a train or something taking off from the station or slowing down where you'd, you'd have a perturbation to what's, what you're standing on. Um, and, and then you'd look at your reactions and how long it takes and all kinds of things. What we developed was something that I thought was a bit closer to the idea of what we really experience most of the time during the day, which is we see something or we step a certain way in reaction to something and, and that movement itself um, sort of takes us off our base of support and makes us more tippy and likely to fall over. And so those are more realistic sort of day-to-day -day things. So we developed this protocol where you'd be standing on um, a force plate or in fact, uh, we used a modified Wii balance board because we wanted these things to be uh, in another study to be something that's make it adapt and use in the community very quickly. Sure. Um, and so you're standing on this, this balance board 
and you're watching a computer screen and on the computer screen, the we've calculated where your center of pressure is, which means if you were to look at your base of support, where is is your the, the center of mass located and where's the most pressure under your base of support. And of course, if you are within your base of support, so in other words, it's in between your feet somewhere, um, you're not likely to fall over just standing there. Uh, as that begins to shift outside your base of support, um, you'll fall down. Of course, that's what people are doing when they're throwing folks in martial arts. We're trying to shift people off their base of support to make them tippy. Um, and in the case of this perturbation, they'd be watching the screen, and then randomly, the dot that represents um, that sort of a center point where all their pressure is, is located would, would move outside of their base of support in a certain direction. And what they'd have to do is follow it. The idea was to to follow that dot. And then as soon as they actually get close to the dot, it zooms back to the center again. And so what they have to do is shift their weight in a direction of going off balance and then quickly shift it back, um, which is was meant and is meant to be um, similar to the kind of things that would happen when somebody is just normally behaving in the world every day. And, and you know, if you have an intact nervous system and no damage, you're doing this kind of stuff all the time and don't even notice it. Um, whereas if you uh, have some balance concerns and some problems uh, based on the pathology, uh, you know, you're in danger and feeling like you're going to fall down sometimes. Um, so the idea was to assess how good and fast and strong people were, how long it took, what what were the synergies of the muscles and the legs and arms that were part of the, these corrections and bringing things back and try to look at then how that that looked before the intervention and then did it change afterwards where the idea would be that um, you would be faster, for example, at returning uh, to the base of support after you've perturbed yourself after the training. I mean, that seems to be what we're seeing as well is what we predicted we would see with these balance corrections. Um, but in terms of the overall percent change, I, we don't have that those numbers quite yet. Um, but uh, the important piece here is that what this is all reflecting, um, and we measure this as well, you know, things like uh, within the nervous system, the adaptations that are occurring in the brain and spinal cord that uh, we can indirectly assess by evoking reflexes and, and looking at what's going on in, in your spinal cord for corrective reactions there as well. We, we also assess those things um, so we can know, um, are we actually inducing meaningful changes in, in the, the nervous system activity? So what's your brain and spinal cord, the, the, what are normally called um, uh, training-induced neuroplasticity, that the idea that the, the nervous system, uh, because it's been subjected to all these different and new stresses of learning the martial arts patterns and the self-defense techniques that involved shifting body weight and moving in certain ways and changing synergies of muscles and attention and posture, that those are providing the cues that drive um, an adaptive change so that your body gets better at doing it, which is what we all consider to be, you know, what happens when we do any kind of training. Mm. I find this subject fascinating. And and if if you, if any of the listeners, well, I'm sure you're, you're hyper aware far more than I am, but if any of the listeners are interested in um, strength training, I mean, it, it, that, that is a industry that has really been leaning into the nervous system, CNS, talking about adaptation for about a couple of years now from, from what I've been observing. And what I find fascinating, because I, I have a very rudimentary understanding of the nervous system, and, and in a moment I'll ask you to talk a little bit more about that, but I'm just kind of setting this up. What I find fascinating when I look at martial arts, when I look at the way many martial arts classes, especially what I see as more traditional martial arts classes, operate, there's no way that they understood the science of the nervous system and how that worked in the body. But it's as if they were still aware of what needed to be done to create those adaptations. And I find that completely fascinating. And I suspect you bumped into the same stuff too and felt the same way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things um, that, that's interesting, uh, especially, you know, in a way you could sort of say, um, I've kind of got a, a collision of worlds in my own experience because of sort of a, a Asian martial arts training um, and sort of Western scientific training and uh, sort of those things sort of colliding or not necessarily colliding, but both those things coexisting. I, I don't think of them as colliding, actually. I think of them very much like a, 
uh, Taoism, yin yang kind of idea that they're coexisting and they're mutually supportive, but they're that they're kind of circling around the the same ideas, but they're just explaining things um, in a different in a different way based on the kind of uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities of the folks who either develop the science, uh, the Western science explanations and discoveries around certain things, or um, the the tried and true method, you know, from the Asian martial arts of people just doing things for a long period of time and 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 figuring out what worked and what didn't work. Um, so I think it's interesting that um, these two things can can coexist. And uh, I, I think an important thing when we try to understand um, something like martial arts training or strength training or any sort of training it is the idea that um, from a scientific perspective, we'd say uh, you're, pro you're providing a stress. Um, you know, your body exists in a certain kind of balance in all of its physiological systems. And the fancy science word for that is homeostasis, but really it just means balance. It, it, it just means that things have adapted to whatever's going on. So if we're thinking about muscle strength, it means um, whatever you do in your daily life and including any training you might do, your body will adapt to the needs that you have told it you need based on what you've done and and physiological systems are, are super thrifty they don't want to adapt to things and, and get extra strong muscles if they don't have to um, because it costs energy all this stuff comes down to sort of evolutionary pressures around how biological systems work and they're extraordinarily thrifty if you want muscles to get stronger you got to stress them and for a, a reasonable amount of overload so that it's a real stress for some period of time so the body finally goes okay 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 we'll We'll activate the muscle more strongly. We'll, we'll make the muscle fibers bigger. We'll put some more mitochondria in there. We'll, we'll do all this stuff because that costs energy. Your body doesn't want to do it unless it has to. And on the flip side, once you stop doing it, the body right away wants to go back to the thriftiest thing. So we'll make those muscle fibers smaller. We'll get rid of some of those mitochondria. We'll reduce the blood flow because you're not using it. So why would it maintain that? It costs energy to do that. And if you think about that idea, then everything that goes on in training is all about stress and adaptation. You're just providing certain stresses and um, watching the body adapt and, and, and change according to that, um, which was a major theme of, of really the, the, the Batman book I wrote, which was all about the physiology of human training, was really about thinking about stresses that go into creating a character like Batman. How does the body adapt? And I use that example now because that's really... In, in that book, I put him as the ultimate sort of martial artist, really. And if we think about the Eastern traditions of doing things, I mean, they didn't think of it necessarily in the way I just described, but that's what they were doing. You know, if you think about really extreme techniques, even of um, some of the, uh, the the hard body conditioning, the iron gun training that you'd find in some of the Chinese texts, or that would be in some of the Okinawan traditions, or you might find in, in Thailand and Muay Thai, you know, where where you'd have people trying to condition the body and skin and bones by repeatedly striking something, they understood that stuff. They, if, you, if you actually go and read those old books that have been translated, and many of them now translated into English, and you learn about how you do iron palm training or something, you know, it starts off with uh, you know, putting your palm repeatedly into something filled with peas or something then filled with sand, and then it's filled with more granular stuff and then it's small pebbles and and you know it's very extreme training um but the point of it is they understood the idea of gradually building up to something um and of repeatedly applying a stress uh, even if they didn't think of it in terms of homeostasis so i think um it's interesting when you do look at different traditions where um, a lot of those ideas are obviously contained in some of the training methodology even though it was never thought of in the way we would understand it now and, and um, I think it's, it, it's, it's very interesting and it's also really important that um, we try to understand things uh, the way we can understand them so we can figure out ways to help optimize them or to help maybe teach them better or, or that kind of thing. But at the same time, not to, um, just because someone else has a different way of describing the same thing doesn't mean that our way of describing it is necessarily better or theirs is better or ours is worse. It's just a different understanding of the same concept. Mm. Now, you mentioned that you, you teach that one of your grad students had earned a black belt from you. Given what you know, your, your understanding of the nervous system, of adaptation, of how the body truly responds to these stresses, do you teach in any different way than you were taught? 
Um, yes, I do. I think. I mean, I definitely. Uh, I've been involved in a variety of things over the years, but but three spent major amounts of time in three different martial arts systems. Um, and uh, I would say that, you know, the the teachers I've had in those different uh, systems had different ways of approaching their own methodology as well as the stuff they were teaching. You know, a lot of, as folks who do martial arts realize, the, there's quite a bit of variability even within a given system based on how the content is delivered um, uh, based on the characteristics of the teacher. And, and a lot of what... Um, I've changed my own teaching practice quite a bit over the years because uh, initially, you know, when you first do something, then you start doing stuff and you just do it the way you were taught it. And I don't mean the content. I don't mean this certain form that or kata or whatever it is that, you know, historically is meant to be taught in this way. I mean how the training is taught, like how you do a warm up, what kinds of things are the technical components, how much is technical versus how much is physical conditioning, those kinds of things. And Certainly, um, I've evolved quite a bit over over time um, to try and reflect my own understanding, both as a martial artist, of course, but also um, from the perspective of science. And, and really, um, at one point, I approached uh, martial arts training, I guess I would say, mostly from the lens of like physical conditioning, um, if I could say it that way, um, more to say just from the perspective of exercise. Um, and I would say that now I contain, you know, still maintain parts of that, but my lens of looking at it is more around uh, motor skill learning and neuroplasticity. And, and re because the idea here is that uh, what you're really trying to do is, is help people figure out how to get their brains and spinal cords to do the right things uh, and remember them. Um, and, and that's a little different than the lens we sometimes have for physical conditioning. And you can have both. Um, but they aren't exactly the same thing. Um, the idea of exercise and training, we often sort of conflate and put together as if they're the same thing. But um, I would say that uh, exercise often is meant in the context more of just the physical conditioning without the technical content so much, whereas training can have both. So I would say that over time, I've tended to uh, evolve a way of my, uh, my own teaching and training that uh, respects both those ideas. Hmm. Now you've brought up neuroplasticity a couple times, excuse me, and you know you gave us a little bit of a definition of what it is, but how do you activate it? How do you create neuroplasticity? Yeah, I mean the basic idea of <clears throat> of of what neuroplasticity is, you know, on on a kind of big big meta sort of a whole systems level, it means getting better at something. Um, but the way that actually works, if you drill right down and you try to imagine, you know, why did you get better at doing that punch or that kick or that receiving action or that strike or that break fall or that throw, whatever it was you did as a martial artist or any any skill, any any activity you're doing, why did that happen? When you start drilling down into that you uh, get right down to thinking about how cells are connected in the nervous system. Um, the, the comp your nervous system has a bunch of different components in it, but the, what we would call more the computational cells are the neurons. Those are the ones that uh, you know, are involved in you know, uh, our pr production of our speech right now that we're having and, and the thoughts we're doing and the, the, the movements we might produce. Um, <clears throat> those neurons have certain properties and using a metaphor, uh, I like to use the same metaphor for the nervous system as, a, as you might do for, you know, a muscular system or any, any biological system. A again, it comes down to this idea of being thrifty and not adapting unless you have to. So um, just to build up the metaphor and come back to the neuroplasticity, but it's related to the same idea. If you went to get stronger at, at lifting a weight, you have to be lifting a weight that's enough outside your body's adapted sort of balance point that you actually need to get stronger, that your nervous system needs to activate more muscle, that you actually need to build stronger muscle tissue. If you aren't exceeding that, um, your body's not going to adapt. So that's an easy one for people to think about. And the same thing is happening on the stuff inside your brain that's producing the actual muscle contraction we were just talking about. The neurons in your motor cortex, that's the part of your brain that, um, that sends the commands down 
from the final decision to move in the brain that go down to the spinal cord and, and activate the neurons in the spinal cord that go up to your muscles that actually cause them to contract. And the important part of all this that's common uh, that underlies the idea of the neuroplasticity is repetition. Um, that one of the main ways in which your nervous system understands that something is important enough to be something it needs to adapt to is when you keep repeatedly providing those stresses. So um, in the same way that um, if you were to do that ancient iron palm training or something from that we'd read about in some of the old Chinese textbooks or in the Bubishi, if it's Okinawan or Japanese karate or something, um, where you're repeatedly you know, banging your hand or arm into something and you're getting calluses and you're getting stronger bones and so on, um, your body's adapting to that stress and giving you that visible change. The invisible change that is, is seen only in the skill you're acquiring is the neuroplasticity you're getting from providing certain sets of commands that you're trying to repeatedly work on a skill um, that is a function of now your brain networks and your spinal cord networks, those collections of neurons now working in a more refined way to produce the pattern you're trying to achieve. And it's when those connections then that uh, are expressed they are strengthened, and they're strengthened by changes in uh, the synapses, which are the connections between neurons, which are incredibly um, uh, flexible depending upon what's actually applied to them um, uh, in terms of training or, or whatever kind of thing we're doing. And that's really the heart of, of neuroplasticity. And, and a way to understand why repetition and specificity, what you're doing is so important, was kind of captured by this, this guy. Um, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, a Canadian psychologist and neurobiologist called Donald Hebb, he came up with this idea that became known as Hebbian plasticity. Uh, so he was back in the day where you got to discover things and then get them named after you. Um, I still haven't gotten one for me, so I think I'll probably end my career with that something named after me, unfortunately, but that's, I'll live with that. But uh, and, and the basic slogan that came of this was, neurons that fire together, wire together. And the idea is that if you're providing the right connections between uh, things, which means providing a certain pattern over and over again, your nervous system will recognize, oh, okay, um, when I'm standing in this way and my body's in this way and the person, you know, I'm moving my muscles, I'm trying to move my arm by activating my muscles, these things are all coming together at the same time, getting the same sensory feedback from what I'm doing, my body receptors are telling me where I'm standing or what I'm doing, and I'm trying to produce this same pattern. Um, that gives rise to to this neuroplasticity, which is really interesting because what you're really doing, you you can't control that directly. It, you you can't just think neuroplasticity uh, when it comes to the motor system. Um, so you're instead trying to emulate and, and reproduce a pattern of of something you've seen. You're learning a new technique. You've watched your teacher do it, and then you're trying to do it, and you're not doing it very well. But you keep trying. You keep trying. What you're doing is providing all the cues for your brain and spinal cord to then slowly adapt to what you're doing to shape it so that it becomes the thing you want with all that kind of uh, firing together, wiring together idea. And that becomes the pattern that uh, emerges. And that is the sort of underlying way in which you're acquiring the skills that go with the activity and, and the specific techniques or, or patterns that you're learning. And that's really what we would think of as, as neuroplasticity, this idea that um, you get this adaptation in the coordination of the nervous system to help produce the movements you're you're trying to learn. So based on the research that you're doing, what is what's the hope? Is the hope that you'll put together a a, a program for aging individuals to to maintain and maybe even improve their nervous system response? It, or is it is the goal here simply to create the data and let others run with it? What are, what are your goals, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the, the, the main thing here is to look at sort of a, a way to have, um, oh, sorry, can you hear the dog in the background? It's a little bit of a squeak, but you can keep going. We've had far worse. Uh, yeah, hopefully my daughters were supposed to keep the dog. Nah, it's all right. Anyways, um, the, the the end goal here of the work we're trying to do um, was originally kind of a proof of principle of these ideas to just sort of see how adaptable and how useful uh, a training stress like learning martial arts might be 
um, for older individuals uh, who are at risk for things like falling and also for those who've had um, you know, nervous system damage. I mean, one of one of the reasons why we got into this was was also driven by the idea that I'm a very strong advocate for accessibility of these training interventions. And so that's why in our other studies, we, instead of developing fancy apparatus that we could have in the lab that would be useful for helping people to, to walk better, we chose devices that you can just go into a rec center and find, um, you know, that are already existing. So if we discovered um, some approaches to how to get better at walking that might help somebody with a stroke, they can just go and do it in the community if they want to. Um, and, and that brings me to the idea of martial arts. I mean, you don't need any equipment at all. You just need space, right? You need space and you need somebody to help teach you something uh, in a safe way. Um, so it's as accessible as you could possibly imagine, like a rehab technique to be. Um, so that was part of it as well, that if we can come up with ideas here, part of it would be yeah, other people can refine some of it. Um, which is, of course, what happens when you publish science. Um, other folks, hopefully, you know, if the ideas that you have tested and the data are all good, then then folks will, um, you know, leverage that into other things. On a personal and more sort of community-based level for myself, I, I am also trying to think about ways that we could start developing, you know, uh, community-based programs that would would have these ideas in them that of a sort of a, just a, a tweaking of how we might teach martial arts but specifically developed for older adults um, who, uh, you know, if, we've, if you train in martial arts long enough, you, you tend to meet lots of older adults who, you know, have been training for long periods of time. You know, I, I think of some of my own teachers and, uh, you know, you're training with somebody who's 75, who's been training for 65 years. You know, you've got somebody who's done that kind of thing. What we don't tend to find nearly as much is somebody who says, oh yeah, I, I just started doing karate or whatever when I was 60, um, or I started when I was 70 or whatever it is, or in the case of you know some of the folks I was mentioning, uh, somebody who's 85 or 90. Um, and what I'm hoping is that we can talk about the benefits of some of the activities um, like martial arts that would be uh, gained by older adults who might do it that would enjoy the kind of training and would therefore be more empowered to think that, hey, this is something that, you know, anybody can do. We, we talk about, you know, martial arts, uh, if it's applied properly as a lifelong activity. Well, that doesn't mean you had to have started it when you were young um, uh, or younger. Uh, why not think about having an entry point um, where you're much older uh, and thinking about, uh, being able to do an activity that's enjoyable. So you're not, you know, we're not trying to talk about doing, you know, sport karate or something like that where we're going in tournaments or something when folks are 85, um, but rather the holistic sort of whole body integrated, you know, mind body stuff that goes on in, in the, at the core of the training anyways is, is the key focus and trying to, to think about getting that to a group of a large group uh, of folks in our societies um, who probably wouldn't, normally see themselves doing those activities. Um, and one of the things that you need from sort of a convincing standpoint sometimes is also the scientific evidence saying, look, here, here's what actually happens to people when they, when they do this. Here, here's how your balance got better. Here's how you got stronger. Here's how there was a change in your spinal cord excitability that tells us about this neuroplasticity, the changes that are happening. Look, here's the psychological questionnaire, which you know assessed your feelings of competency and empowerment, and so on. Look, look at how your viewpoint has changed. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that uh, the science help inform us around, and that and that I hope other people will take up and, and continue to do. But also for uh, in, in my own hands here in my own community, uh, thinking about ways to create um, actual community-based streams where older adults can. Think about yeah, you know what? Um, I, I'm going to do my martial arts training. I, I want to do that. I've always wanted to, and now I have an opportunity, and I'm not put off by the idea that you know, it's a young person's activity or something. Mm. Th this has been fascinating stuff, and, and I'm hoping that the listeners are enjoying it. If nothing else, I am, and, and you're educating me. And heck, it's my show, so I, I, I get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get to take some joy in, in learning. But I imagine that we might have some school instructors out there listening, saying, okay, I get it. I hear what you're saying, but I'm not quite sure where to start. So what, if you were to give people in charge of curriculum one thing to 
to start with to t- that incorporates the science, the evidence, the things that you're understanding into their own programs, what would that be? I, I would say start slow. I mean, one of the things that, um, uh, that we see in a lot of martial arts training uh, intervention, uh, not training interventions, but actual training experiences that folks have. It really is a lot of the time taught more for, you know, the really active young adult in the sense of how intense it might be, uh, what the demands uh, might be. Um, And I'm not talking about taking away the authenticity or the integrity of something. I'm just saying, slow it down. Um, Just simplify it a little bit, you know, make it less, you know, if, if your, uh, whatever your martial arts practice uh, involves, a lot of kicking techniques or things like that that would challenge balance uh, significantly. Well, modify it initially, um, or find other parts of your training curriculum where um, you you have exercises and drills and, and forms and so on that folks could practice to, d- to build up their skills that don't have those extreme balance challenges at first. Uh, and, and realize that eventually a lot of these folks will get to the point where they'll be able to do those things, but it's going to take longer so that you need to have that, you know, go slow and, and, and um, be very patient and have different expectations on, on the time for the outcomes. Um, that's the biggest thing uh, I, I would say. And that's something we spend a lot of time sort of thinking about when it came to um, the intervention stuff that, that we, we've been trying to do. Uh, based on modification of some of my, the systems I train in. And um, it just means changing your, your frame of reference. So um, it, it doesn't mean teaching. It means teaching the same kind of content with the same intentions, but the specifics are just different for the group you're working with. Um, and that the trajectory for how long it will take uh, somebody who's like 70 or 75 or something starting one of these interventions it's going to take them a lot longer to get to where you might think a, a, a person who's 30 uh, would get to, but that's okay. I mean, that's fine. It sort of means adjusting your expectations, I guess, along with going slow. Um, now, for some folks, uh, that's going to be hard to do depending upon um, what their practice is normally like and um, the, the way that they teach martial arts or the things that they get, get out of it. So for example, if you're, if your uh, focus is is predominantly on just you know sports application and, and tournament fighting and so on, then what I'm saying is it's going to be harder to implement, to be honest. Um, but if it includes, uh, it has a component there, but also includes other what you might call more traditional training, it's going to be a little easier to implement. Um, but it, it just takes some adaptation of the methodology so that it fits better with the group you're trying to uh, to teach and, and share your knowledge with. And, you know, I, I think it just, it's just a bit of a shift in perspective. I don't think it, I, I, I believe, at least based on my own experience as well, that it can still be authentic. It can still have integrity. Um, it's just implemented a little bit differently. So now do you see what I mean by that intro? How do you boil that conversation down? There was a lot there. There's some great stuff there. And Personally, I found some really actionable information on how to look at the way I train, the way I teach, the way I view people in martial arts. And that's what it's all about. That's what we hope to do with this show is to give you tools that you can work from. And Sensei Zare, thank you for coming on and giving us such absolutely wonderful cutting edge information. I appreciate it and hope to have you back someday to talk more about the research that you're doing. If you want to see the links and get a transcript, photos, all the other stuff that we've got going on, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, episode 421. You can see all the resources for this episode. You can find all the other episodes. We don't paywall them. We don't do any of that silly stuff that other shows do. You can get access to everything we've ever done for free. And if you feel like helping us out because of all that stuff that we've done, Easiest thing to do, best thing, go to whistlekick.com, grab yourself a t-shirt, grab yourself a a new uniform, maybe some training gear. We work really hard to make sure that the stuff we put out is the best we can make. And hopefully there's something over there that you can use. Now, if not, 
Don't forget you can share an episode or leave us a review. Anything you can do to support us, we would really appreciate that. Our social media, at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>